Hello, and welcome to this episode of our Analyst Angle series. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at the Cube Research. And today I'm joined by Kelly Gage, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for Commerce Tools. And we are going to talk today about some insights gained from a couple of research studies that the team at Commerce Tools has recently done, focused on the state of e-commerce, exploring the replatforming replatforming and migration trends for 2024, and also then honing in on some investments that are driving holiday sales. EGADS, the holiday season, it's here. Oh my gosh, Kelly, I'm not ready. But welcome. I'm so glad to have you. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you and I had some time to spend together a few months ago in Miami at the Commerce Tools Elevate event, and it's great to see you again. I know that your yeah. role at Commerce Tools has evolved over the course of the past handful of years. You spent about five years as the company's chief product officer. In 2022, you took on the role of chief strategy officer. I'd love for you to share a little bit with us, if you would, about kind of your career backstory. What's that journey been like for you? Sure. So I was coming of age just as uh, the internet really started to become a thing. And in high school, I built websites for local businesses. Fantastic. Um, a way to get going in the industry and um I hope nobody from adobe is listening but i had my hacks copy of dreamweaver uh, i was pretty tight with that back then um and then worked for Foot Locker, um doing front-end work there was recruited by atg which is now oracle commerce and deployed a, a lot of those properties to production a lot of the first big mall retailers like dsw shoes for example those types of organizations um, and then Walmart for quite a while is their chief ATG architect. And then Oracle is a product manager. Uh, I also wrote e-commerce in the cloud there and um, for O'Reilly. And then I joined Commerce Tools about uh, a little over eight years ago now yeah. as a so first have, chief product officer. So you have just a tiny bit of experience in that whole e-commerce business. Tiny bit. A little so. Bit. <laughs> well, as I mentioned, you and the team at Commerce Tools, you've published a couple of reports. We're going to dive into those in a minute. But before we go there, I'd love for you to share with me your thoughts on the state of the e-commerce industry. What are some of the key trends that you're seeing right now? Um, we're seeing rising consumer sentiment. Um, I think now that rates have come down a little bit, I think folks are, are looking a little more positively at the economy. Um, so that's quite positive. I think people are feeling a little bit more optimistic. And I think after the election, especially, um, you know, that's a, a big, uh, you know, open item. And I think folks are going to feel a lot more confident, you know, either direction once it's just decided. Yeah. So I think people are feeling um, positive generally about their finances and about the outlook. That's good. Um, also see a lot of social media now, you know, TikTok shops is, is being um, very widely used and that's great to see. Yeah. Um, we see a lot of folks um, buying exclusively on mobile devices these days. So the mm -hmm. percent of mobile has increased pretty dramatically. Um, again, interest rates have led to a lot of retailers investing more. They you know, and we'll talk about this more in the report, but you know, it's obviously that uh, retailers and brands need to be investing more. And we are starting to see that a little bit more, which is great. And that results yeah. in better customer experience. And generally, I'm a big believer that to differentiate in retail, you have to compete on price. And, you know, unless you're Amazon or Walmart, you're probably not going to compete on price. Uh, product assortment. So that's having unique differentiated products. And that's a, a real opportunity. Um, customer experience right? And being part of the brand behind the scenes tours, those are all great opportunities to interact and differentiate. Um, and then logistics. And again, unless you're Amazon or Walmart, you're probably not going to win on that. So it really comes down to product assortment and it comes down to experience. And that's why we at Commerce Tools invented Atlas Commerce. And uh, we really allow our customers to build those differentiated experiences. You know, it's funny, so much of what you talk about, and, and I know that we talked about this a lot at Elevate, but, you know, I am uniquely positioned, <laughs> you know, I'm the chief consumer in in our, my family, and um, I, all of these things, I shop on mobile devices, I shop on social sites, I have very firm opinions on what kind of customer experiences I'm interested in, and you could have the most amazing product on the planet and the best assortment of offerings. 
But if I have a negative customer experience, and it, it could be as simple as a clunky checking out a checkout experience, or it could be a problem. Um, you know, I just had a problem with an order and, and the brand made me jump through so many hoops and it was their mistake. And it's like, I'm never buying from you again. So that, that customer experience part of the equation cannot be overstated. And, and I think that consumers are savvy and, um, you know, and, and they can certainly be a pain in the neck, but you know, when, when you're asking me to hand over my money for something that you're selling, I want to have a great experience every, from everything, you know, the web experience to the payment experience to the, you know, the shipping experience and all of that sort of thing. So I think that it's really a critical part of my daily life to have, <laughs> to have people like you making those things possible. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, and you know, something interesting, sorry, just to keep going no, for one second. Um, what's fascinating is when I was just getting started in this industry in the early 2000s, it was very common to have a quarterly release to production. That was it. And we have customers now who are releasing their production once every minute. So the increase, it, the cycle of innovation has increased pretty substantially. And that's always that great to see. Quarterly to minute to minute. That's kind of mind blowing and not surprising really. So I want to talk now about something that uh, it is front and center in your reports, but replatforming. And the move to more flexible, scalable platforms. Why is this such a key area of focus for, for businesses right now? Um, I think a lot of brands are still failing to deliver on the core promise of delivering a personalized shopping experience for consumers. Yeah. You know, the websites are old. They're undifferentiated. Um, they're based on monolithic, outdated technologies that only allow quarterly releases to production. Um, they just can't innovate very fast. And we at Commerce Tools invented Mock, which is microservices, APIs, cloud, and headless. And that form of architecture has just become the default industry standard. Yeah. So in our report, we had 41% of our customers say that the top reason to switch was to create better experiences. And I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah, and I think from a competitive standpoint, Kelly, you know, again, is the chief consumer officer in my organ in my company and my family um you know the, the the challenge i think that organizations face on the customer experience standpoint is that brands are out there creating amazing shopping and customer experiences and right. so we know what that looks and feels like and if you're not there if you're not delivering at that level we're not patient as a whole, you know, right. we're not, we're not going to sit around and wait for you to get on the ball and make it happen. You know, we know that we can probably easily find, you know, something similar somewhere else and we don't have to jump through the hoops that, you know, whatever is happening. And, and so I think that from a competitive standpoint, this really is something that, that kind of can't be ignored. Right. And if you take the time to walk into a physical store and you have an actual physical shopping cart and you load it up with products, if checkout takes too long, that's fine. I mean, it's not fine, but you're not going to just walk away. But online, at least, you need to be able to offer those very fast, differentiated, personalized experiences because the switching yeah. costs are very low. Yeah. Just get up and walk away. Yeah, absolutely. Get distracted. So let's walk through some of the highlights from this newly published research report, the state of e-commerce, replatforming, and migration trends for 2024. And this report explored the replatforming strategies of leading B2B manufacturing, retail, and consumer packaged goods. So one thing that immediately jumped out at me from this report is that there's clearly some dissatisfaction in the industry. Only 14% of respondents reported being satisfied with their current platforms. Okay, well, that presents a huge opportunity for commerce <laughs> tools now, doesn't yes, it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I like that. Um, so, you know, and, and tech limitations impact organizations in many, many ways. So let's talk a little bit about, about those limitations. What are they and how does this impact an organization's ability to both serve their customers with best-in-class experiences and also help them stay competitive? Yeah, um, you're right. 92% uh, of recent migrants said that they were recently satisfied or very satisfed with migration to a new platform. So clearly after they adopt something new, 
they tend to be quite satisfied. It's the real problem is the status quo and the status yeah. quo is slow. It's legacy. A lot of it's on premises. A lot of times they're being taken advantage of by their existing vendors, slow to release production. Um, you know, we've got a, a couple of data points here. Um, limited scalability is 35% of the reason why yeah. folks are dissatisfied, delayed implementations, low quality customer support poor end customer experiences, lack of advanced features. You know, they're just an awful lot of really legacy limiting platforms on the market right now. And unfortunately, folks are kind of stuck on some of them. Yeah. So that's why we see such a big interest in replatforming right now. Well, and I think, you know, these pain points, you know, limited scalability. Okay, that's one. But but when we're talking about, you know, low quality customers must low quality customer support, poor end user experience, and then a lack of uh, advanced features. And again, these are things that consumers are, are experiencing all the time. It's like, it doesn't take much to, to be dissatisfied enough to walk away. So I think that those pain points kind of speak for themselves there. Um, you know, another thing, unfortunately true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, one of the things that I, I you know, I touched on here a little bit ago, but, you know, this is a demanding customer segment, okay? And one thing that is 100% certain is that customers are not sitting around patiently waiting for you to get your act together when it comes to serving up those best-in-class experiences. We know what they look like and we want them. And right. um, But that really also plays a huge role in, you know, those tech limitations impact an organization's ability to enhance customer experiences, but it also really impacts their ability to stay competitive. And I think that those are some key things that, you know, really shined through in the report. Yeah, hundred yeah. um, percent. So looking at those who have made a migration, 90% in, in, um, experienced increase in sales and revenue. Yeah. Um, and 30% of those said that their sales increased by 30% or more. So like really substantial gains to be had by modernizing. And, yeah. you know, another challenge I see a lot of brands face is they still haven't mastered the basics. You know, how often have you been asked to log in again when you've already just logged in? You know, how often are you not getting customer service? You know, I'm not going to name the brand, but I was passing through Minneapolis airport. I needed a, a luggage and they had a text to chat with our store associates feature. Yeah. And I had this really nice message that I sent while in flight and I'm passing through and I've got cash in hand. I want to buy and nobody ever responded like ever. They just never responded to me. And I, it's unfortunate, but that is, uh, you know, un unfortunately the norm here sometimes. Well, and I will say, and I have a feeling we're somewhat similar on this front. Um, when you're immersed in this, in the technology ecosystem and you know that there's a better way <laughs> and right, you know right. that this is not you're not asking a lot you know and it's just that makes it even i think that makes it even more frustrating the more knowledgeable you are you know the higher their expectations are and so it's really interesting you know one of the things that i that i noticed in the report this ability to compete um, that was the number one metric identified by people who have both recently migrated and then, you know, people who are potentially thinking about that. And this is how they assess the value of their investment. Um, 67% of recent migrators cited that metric as important. 58% of potential migrators said it was important. So, you know, I mean, this is not, in, in my opinion, this is not a, oh, we should get around to this someday. This is like a listen to what, uh, listen to what your customers are saying, listen to what the industry is saying. And, um, you know, they're, and, you know, as you pointed out, um, 90% of migrators seeing significant revenue and sales growth. Okay. Sign me up. Right. Well, yeah. and, you know, the challenge is, is demographics are changing and younger folks in their twenties, you know, especially for the B2Bs out there, they don't want to talk to people. You know, they want to speak, um, they want to work with a functioning website or app. Yeah or other e-commerce experience. And they want to get what they want and they want to experience the brand sometimes, but they want to be able to pick their own journey. And e-commerce is awfully stagnant out there. You know, a lot of the flows are very traditional. Um, and thankfully we have some fantastic customers who are really innovating and building some differentiated experiences. But, you know, a lot of e-commerce just looks the same from brand and retailer 
of across the board. So we, uh, we're seeing composable commerce make a pretty big change there already. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we've talked about this extensively in the short conversation, but you know, the, the one data point that triggered e-commerce migrations is the, the need to create better, more personalized customer experiences. That right. said, you know, there are challenges when it comes to switching platforms. It's not just a, let's just flip a switch. Um, talk with me a little bit, if you would, about those challenges and how, how customers can address them. Yeah. And, you know, the, the era of big re-platforms is thankfully over. You know, when I was getting started, a lot of these were first generation, but, you know, very quickly we had second generation platforms. And what you do is you build up an entire parallel separate stack and then uh, you would, on a Sunday night, usually, I'll stay in the office until midnight or 2 a.m. and then flip the switch and hope that it all works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Like, that was the default back then. And now with Composable, which we helped invent at Commerce Tools, you can yeah. incrementally adopt these platforms over the course of weeks, you know, if not um, months, you know, yeah. and full months. And one of our customers, Alta Beauty, launched buy online, pick up, and store in just seven days. And that's a good example of how it doesn't have to be a big, big release. You know, it doesn't yeah. have to be, a, I hope this works or I'm going to get fired type of moment, yeah. right? And you can incrementally uh, tackle your leading business problems. Yeah. Well, and I think about it a little bit as, you know, a 20 plus career as a strategist. Um, I think about it a little bit as, you know, a, a Lego building something with a bunch of Legos and in your composable commerce um, tech stack, if you will, is something, it's as easy as, you know, let me slide this functionality in here. And I think this is what's going to happen. And this is how it's going to work. Oh my gosh, it's great. Oh, this is perfect. Or oh, not quite what I wanted here. Let me tweak that. Let me slide this red block. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's what composable commerce is. And you have the ability to put the pieces of the puzzle together, pieces of the Lego creature yeah. that you're building, a creation that you're building, right? And so I, I think that that's really what it's all about, you know? And the days of of that, those cross fingers and holding your breath and worrying about losing your job and, you know, all, I mean, and not that making changes doesn't still have its own, you know, moments of anxiety, but I think the ability to be agile and flexible and move quickly and pivot even more quickly. I think all of those are parts of the, the value proposition here of composable that are pretty hard to ignore. But now I want to shift to the holiday season and explore some of the findings from your holiday report. This report is called Unwrapping Success, Key Investments Driving Holiday Sales, and really kind of taking a look at what the business outlook there is. Um, okay, why is there an urgency in investing in tech? tech upgrades that are centered on creating better customer experiences, especially as we approach this holiday season or really any, any holiday season, why is there such a sense of urgency? I think a lot of it is just creating those personalized brand experiences. In our report, we found 41% of brands and retailers uh, were upgrading e-commerce explicitly for that reason. Again, a lot of e-commerce is undifferentiated and in an era of the big, uh, you know, Amazons and Walmarts of the world and Shein and Timu, you know, you've got to keep pace with them and even out, you know, get out in front of them. And I think you can yeah. do that with composable commerce. We've got a lot of great customer examples of folks who've done that. You know, speaking of Shein and Timu, I just literally moments before we hopped on to record, I was reading an article about um, the future might not look so rosy for them with some, maybe some new regulations coming down the pike. So that'll be interesting to watch. Um, okay. I noted from the report that there are three main areas where business leaders are investing to help mitigate risks and drive holiday sales in 2024. These are modern e-commerce platforms and composable commerce, social mm -hmm. commerce, and AI. Let's take them one at a time. Modern e-commerce platforms and composable commerce. I mean, this is kind of what we've been already been talking about, but how can embracing this help meet customer demands, drive sales and business growth, especially during the holiday season? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these legacy platforms have um, downtime, which is just completely unacceptable. And the ability of a commerce platform to help an organization compete was the number one metric for both recent and potential yeah. migrators in our study. So 67% yeah. cited that as the reason why. That just the bar for competition has gone up. 
and composable commerce puts folks ahead of the competition, not behind. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right. Well, we talked a little bit about social commerce. Um, in your report, 77% of co companies share they're looking to boost social media channel usage in 2024, which comes as zero surprise to me. Um, Facebook shop, marketplace, 71% of businesses plan to use this for holiday sales. TikTok, 55% of companies investing there for holiday campaigns. We've got Instagram reels, so many other things. So what is, why is driving social commerce capabilities so critical? I have a feeling it all has to do with where consumers are. That's exactly it. That's where the eyeballs are. <laughs> You know, folks don't want to download an app. You know, there's still friction in downloading standalone shopping apps. You have to download and install and log in, you know, and a lot of times people don't want that. They're instead following a fitness influencer, for example, yeah. who might post something for sale through Instagram or through TikTok shop, right? And they want right. the ability to consume their social media, scroll their feed. And oh, by the way, here's a product that might go along with what I was just looking at. So it's yeah. much more in line with where the eyeballs are these days. Yeah, absolutely. You know, from a personal standpoint, I am so over brands asking me to download their app. Um, and I don't care. That I don't care if you're offering me a discount. I don't care what the incentive is because I want to shop where I want to shop. I don't want to download yet another app. I I, right. I don't want, I, I just want the process to be easy and I'm not going to live inside your app. I'm not going to buy more because I've downloaded your app. I'm not going to turn on notifications because I've downloaded your app. You know, so I really, I, I think the the focus on social channels makes a lot of sense. This is not in any way new. I mean, we've been shopping and buying and and marketing and social channels for many years now, but it, it, I think that continues to grow and it continues to be such an important channel. Um, you know, I noticed from your report that, you know, payments, uh, payment options are also super important. I saw from your report that seven in 10 retailers said they're investing in diversified payment channels. Um, 90% of the retailers participating in the survey said that composable commerce is is going to enhance their customer experiences this holiday season. And and a really impressive 88% said that they see composable as the key to their ability to be flexible, uh, allowing them to launch more capabilities faster, easier, and of course, then the whole regrail of delivering on, you know, better customer experiences. Anything else pop out at you from the from the research on on social that you want to mention? Yeah, there was a Forrester study done a few years ago, and they did a survey of people's time use on their mobile devices. And they found that they spent like 98% of their time in a couple apps. And it was as you would expect, it was email, it was text messaging, Facebook, Instagram, yeah. um, Twitter, you know, it's just a handful of those apps. And now it's all TikTok, Instagram. Yeah. They just don't switch back and forth between apps. There's such a long tail out there, hard to find them on the screen. You know, it's got to be a really compelling brand offer value proposition to get someone to download and use it. I'm not saying it's not impossible, but the bar is pretty high these days. Yeah. And I think yeah. a lot of these brands just check the box of building an app when they don't necessarily, it's not necessarily why customers are browsing and they're browsing them on desktop or mobile web or on social. Yeah. The head could be really anything at this point. Yeah. And I think that, you know, today's consumers are, you know, sort of a little ADD in way, you know what I'm saying? We're bouncing mm -hmm. around. I'm on Facebook. Oh, I'm on Instagram. Oh, I'm over here on TikTok. Oh, my, uh, you know, my 18 year old daughter is sending me a text message with a link to something that she saw on TikTok that she wants me to buy for, you know, like we right. are popping all around. And so I feel like, you know, the, the, the retailers who really understand that consumer behavior, uh, understand how important it is to not only show up in those spaces, but to be able to create experiences that make it so easy for me to give you my money. And, and that's really what it's all about. You know, I mean, it's like all those hoops, sometimes, you know, sometimes the things that you have to do, you know, entering tons of information and everything else, you know, all, and, and sometimes you're doing on a mobile device, that's a pain in the neck, you know, but I can just push a button. 
I'm so much happier. And I, and I think that what we're seeing is retailers really embrace that in Composable and, and think about how all the, how many things can we eliminate as part of this path to purchase, right? Right. It, it, you have to replicate when you're in a store and you know, you're checking out and there's some gum sitting there and candy, right? Those impulse purchases. Yeah. That's what we really need to replicate as an industry. And yeah. I think in our survey, we found that 64% of brands and retailers are looking to do more short form social media. And again, it's really capturing that impulse buy. Yeah. Yeah. I need that. <laughs> I say that 10 times a day, probably. All right. The last one is artificial intelligence. So we've talked about this pretty much ad nauseum here, but personalized experience, they are not a trend. They are an expectation. Uh, your survey showed that 62% of businesses are already leveraging AI, another 32% are planning to implement it. But it's not just about using AI. It's about using the right kind of AI to drive measurable results. Okay, Kelly, what is the right kind of AI? Um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I think the best form of AI is AI that serves a business need. I think there's a lot of blind pressure out there to add AI features in for the sake of adding AI features. And we're regularly asked by existing customers and prospects, you know, what AI features do you have? And I always gently push back on that and say, you know, that's, I, that's not the right question to be asking. The right question to be asking instead is what business value are you delivering? And oh, by the way, it might happen to use AI behind the scenes. Yeah. And like you mentioned, personalization is a fantastic example. You know, personalization is now much better due to AI. You can build websites, mobile apps, experiences, code faster, right? That's a, a really good example of where, you know, the AI really becomes beneficial. Yeah. Um, but also good use cases are fraud detection, personalized advertising and marketing, forecasting, demand yeah. prediction. Yeah. Customer support is going to be really big. Um, oh, absolutely. Quality assurance. You know, and, and to me, I think that, you know, when it comes to addressing customer issues, um, problems with an order or anything else, you know, nobody really wants to go to the trouble. First of all, nobody wants to have something not be perfect when they order right. something and, and it's received. Okay. But it happens. Um, but sometimes the process of, you know, going to the website, finding the order number, reporting a problem, and then getting that email that says, you know, we'll be back to you in 24 to 48 hours. We are passionate about customer That's service. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous because then what happens is that I go on with my life. I forget this. I get annoyed. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, two days later, I finally get like, there is a better way. And to me, when AI can power some of those uh, customer service efforts, I think that's going to be a huge thing and something that's very much needed because in many instances, we're still stuck in the dark ages there. Yeah, 100% yeah. we are. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I also noticed that um, site performance and customization was a key success factor that that the respondents in your survey uh, mentioned. 94% of survey respondents reported that their migration significantly improved their site performance and 88% reported that moving to a new platform offered more customization. So I think that's kind of a ringing, and ringing endorsement that, you know, things are working yeah. the way they're supposed to be working, right? 100% modern tech is, is just that it's very modern and we literally invented this category. So yeah. best than us. Yeah. You ought to be good at it. <laughs> Well, Kelly, we've impacted a lot of information, both from the results of your current state of e-commerce study, as well as from the key investments driving holiday sales. As we wrap the show, I'm going to ask you for one piece of advice that you'd leave our audience with as they're thinking about their current e-commerce platforms and their strategies and you know what they can do to help them get to measurable results more quickly. I think the number one piece of advice is to work incrementally and deliver that business value using composable commerce, solve real business problems, whether or not you happen to use AI behind the scenes, demonstrate value to your business stakeholders, uh, to your CEOs, um, and just keep chipping away at it because yeah. ultimately you'll get through that backlog and, you know, at least on par and you know, hopefully uh, should be able to get ahead of competition 
uh, with Composable, just as our many customers have done. Yeah. You know, I when I've thought about this, I feel like time is short and opportunities are here. You know, opportunities abound. And making that transition to composable com commerce and replatforming sooner rather than later, you know, I mean, there's, you know, the thing about a research study and, and talking with customers on this front that I always love is that, you know, people aren't saying, ah, eh, you know, my results were kind of so-so. I mean, what people who are doing this, who've made this transition, what they're saying is, oh, my goodness, it's amazing. We have to do this. Right? We have to do this. This becomes a necessity. I wish, yeah. <laughs> I wish we hadn't waited so long, but let's forget about that. And just they're really excited. And, and you know, I, I mean, at Elevate, I felt that excitement in the air when I was talking with your customers. And I talked to There is people, a better way. <laughs> yeah, no, there is a better way. And significant bene uh, business benefits and increased revenue, growth, and the ability to serve up better customer experiences. I mean, like this is yeah. a big, big win. So I, I so appreciate you, Kelly Gates, Chief Strategy Officer for Commerce Tools. Thanks so much for joining me today and walking me through these timely industry reports. Your insights have been incredibly valuable, and I so appreciate the time you've spent with me and with our audience. So thank you. Nice to talk to you again. Absolutely. So with that, that's a wrap for this episode. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at the Cube Research. Thank you for joining us here at the Cube, your source for enterprise and emerging tech news. We'll see you next time.